facial bones. Let's continue with the maxilla, all right? Maxilla, whoops, did we disconnect? All of a sudden I couldn't hear it, there we go. All right, maxilla, as you know, is the upper jaw. It's called the keystone of the face. Remember, the sphenoid was the keystone of the base of the skull. The maxilla is the keystone of the facial bones. And by this, we mean that all facial bones are touching the maxilla except one. All facial bones touch maxilla. But one. Which one is that? The mandible, sure. And that's the mandible. Now, there are two maxilla. Let's continue on and name these other bones of the face quickly and just become familiar with them because, as I said before, we're going to bring in muscle attachments. So the maxilla was the upper jaw and it has a protrusion that comes off from it, which is called a zygomatic process. It has a zygomatic process, which we'll come back to in a moment. And it also has a role in forming the roof of the mouth. So the anterior roof of mouth is formed by the maxilla. So the next bone will take the nasal bones. There are two nasal bones. What do they form? They form the bridge. Well, those of us who are wearing glasses, our glasses are sitting on our nasal bones. So they form the bridge of the nose. And then we have what are called the lacrimal bones. There are two lacrimal. We'll understand those when we decide, uh, discuss the uh, tear formation. And these will be on the medial portion of the orbit, but it's the inferior medial orbit. And then if we come across from our nasal to our lacrimal and move laterally, we'll have the zygomatic bones. So that's a separate bone. We have then two zygomatic bones. And this will form the medial as the middle aspect of the cheekbone. So this will form middle aspect of cheekbone. So now you've had all the components of the cheekbone. You just had the zygomatic process of the maxilla. You have the maxilla and then you had another zygomatic process. Where was it coming from? Temporal, right. 
So your whole cheekbone is made up of three bones. You have a zygomatic process, which just meant a bar, a zygomatic process of maxilla. You have the zygomatic bone. And the zygomatic process of the temporal bone. So you just have to pretend that you're an orthopedic surgeon and somebody has been run into the windshield, right? Everything is mashed. You have to put it back together again. So it gives you a reason why it's important to know these. So as we move down then, let's have two we're palatine bones. And they will form the posterior portion of your hard palate. This is posterior roof of mouth. So now you've had two bones that are forming the roof of the mouth, right? The roof of the mouth is called the hard palate. So anterior, we had the facial, the um, maxillary bone. You can call it either maxilla as a noun or maxillary bone as an adjective. Hard palate anteriorly, posteriorly, you'll have the palatine bones. Now, where do we want to go? Let's go to the nose, the lateral nose. We'll have the inferior Punch, A-E is plural. This is in the lateral, it's inferior lateral nasal cavity. We get this all again when we get to respiration. We've got to start through the nasal nasal cavity, you have to learn how it's built. So this is just giving us our skeleton. And now, where shall we go? Let's go to the uh, vomer. You have two inferior conch, you have one vomer. <coughs> Excuse me, I have a cough, I apologize. But I will have to cough occasionally. One vomer on the medial nasal cavity. What's a common term for this bone? What's forming the medial portion of your nasal cavity? Septum, you've heard of septum. Sometimes people have deviated ones, they go sideways. All right, we'll come to that later though. So now, how are we coming? We've got the vomer, have we forgotten any of these? Does anybody see one we've forgotten? No, we're fine. Then we want to give the last one, which we have mentioned, but we want to give more detail to it because it forms the only movable joint of the skull, and that's the mandible. Only movable. <coughs> no. 
night of skull. You have to be ready when you go out and teach other people because when you're teaching little kids and they say, well, there, we have another movable joint, and you ask them which one it is, teeth. And they'll show you that their teeth can wiggle, but you have to let them know that teeth aren't bones. And the only movable joint is this one. So let's look at what the mandible is offering. It has a process that comes out like this and one that comes up like this and around. So this one, I wonder if I have one here that's loose or just attached. Attached to. I don't know that you can see it. But you have the condyloid process. This process here is the condyloid. And it forms the TM joint. your temporal mandibular joint that we had before. This is the coronoid process. Coronoid process. And we'll see, right now it has a metal spring attached to it, but in your head it will have a major muscle coming down for you to close your mouth. So we need to know where the coronoid process is versus the condyloid. Then the other just names that define the angle and the bony portion back here, the ramus. Ramus means branch. Doesn't make much sense right there, but that's its name. Then the angle. See, and you can feel the angle. Feel the angle. It's quite sharp there, right? We're going to use that because we're going to use a pressure point from it later when we start the arterial system. So you need to know where these bones are on you so you'd be able to find them in the case of emergency on somebody else. So here's the body of the mandible. So this gives us then just a brief outline once again of our facial bones. And now we want to move on for more of our axial skeleton and pick up the hyoid bone as we continue down the axis of the body. How many have heard of your hyoid bone before? Quite a few. All right. This, we're still axial skeleton, so we'll just put hyoid here. It's a little bone that many people haven't heard of. It's U-shaped. And you find it in the anterior of your neck. Anterior of neck. It will be inferior to the mandible. So you know where your mandible is now, so you know roughly where you're going to be inferior to mandible and superior to your larynx. What's the part of the larynx that you can feel right here? What's it called? Adam's apple, right? While I'm talking now, mine's going up and down. So swallow and you'll feel yours go up and down, right? That's the larynx. So somewhere between here and here, you have this little U-shaped bone. And the best way, most skeletons don't have it because when they, um, it doesn't have a bony attachment. It's just in this position here with the U-shaped. This would be anterior and this is posterior. But you can pick it up if you put, allow your head to sort of be soft and your neck soft. You can get the two arms of the U and make it go back and forth. 
It has no bony attachments. <coughs> no bony attachments. Only muscles and ligaments. All right, next let's go look at the vertebra so that we're getting those in the line of our whole, come this far, turn it around, and pick up these, which are in the center axis specifically, and see how they're designed to carry out their functions. So the vertebral column is next. We have 33 bones in the vertebral column. We'll have seven cervical. What does cervical mean? Neck. We'll have 12 thoracic. And these are called our movable vertebra. A little bit twisted here. Get it around. So these are all flexible. We come down to the we should put in our five lumbar here because they're flexible too. Or movable if you prefer. And then we have the immo Im immovable, the sacral, five sacral, and four coccygeal, coccygeal. When you speak of the coccyx, it's the same thing. And these are immovable. Now, we can say that this is a column. When you look at it posteriorly, it is a column. But when we look at it laterally, we have curves. So if we have a head and we're posterior, we have a column. we have a head and we're laterally, we're going to first have a curve this way, then we're going to have a curve this way, then we're going to have a curve this way, then one this way, and one down here. So this will be our cervical curve, this will be our thoracic curve, our lumbar curve, our sacral curve, and our coccygeal down here. So you can see that they're normally just slightly curved. But you can have abnormal curves. And the abnormal curves have specific names. what do we commonly call an accentuated thoracic curve? Accentuated thoracic curve. What do we call it? Hunchback. Heard of the hunchback of Notre Dame? Did you see the, the picture? No. but. 
very accentuated. So it's called a hunchback. But the scientific name is kyphosis. Kyphosis. What do we call an accentuated lumbar curve? Sway back. Accentuated lumbar curve is a sway back. What's the technical term? Lordosis. Lordosis. It's easy to remember because lumbar begins with an L and lordosis becomes with an L. Begins with an L. Now we also have a deviated lateral curve. So if this is my column, this is posterior, I can have a curve that's going this way. So it's a lateral accentuated lateral curve. And it's usually in the thoracic area. Anybody know what it's called? Scoliosis. A lot of you know that one. Scoliosis. And what's characteristic of scoliosis? It's more frequent in females than males, and it frequently appears during puberty. Has anybody had scoliosis? Several of you, right. So that's why you know scoliosis. So it's a lateral deviation and uh, occurs more frequently in females and appears at puberty. Many may have just a slight deviation. When you get your physical, you know, your physician usually runs the hand down the spine. Doesn't? No? Nope. Maybe he just looks. <laughs> but the point is that if they find just a slight deviation, they'll just announce it. If it's accentuated, then you may have to get a brace and get some help and so that you get the full support of a vertebral column. So that's scoliosis. Those are some of the abnormal curves. Let's continue then and see uh, what a typical vertebra looks like. We're going to see deviations from the norm, but we'll also look at a typical one. So this is our typical vertebra. And it will look something like this. We'll have a spine coming up, have a process coming out. Coming down and a body down here. Tubral canal in here. We'll name these in a moment. So let's just start with this. This is posterior, anterior. This is called a spinous process. Spinous process. This area in here is called a lamina, lamina.
This process is a transverse. It's running transverse. Remember that term. Transverse process. All of these are for muscular attachments to, you, to be able to do all the activities you do. And then we come down to the vertebral canal. This is the vertebral canal. What do we find in the vertebral canal? Spinal cord, right. So it's protecting the spinal cord. And then you have this large body, which we'll see has different arrangements in different vertebrae, depending on function. This is the body. And we need for the vertebra to communicate with each other. So we're going to need an articular process so one can fit against the other so they can move. A articular process. It's difficult to draw them in uh, two dimensions, but they're coming up here. We'll just sort of do them like this. These will be articular processes. And we'll have a process on the thoracic ones for the ribs. So we'll have a costal facet here, a costal facet for ribs, and that will be in the thoracic area because we see that the ribs are coming around, they're articulating with the transverse process here as a costal facet. So that gives us a basic vertebra, typical vertebra. Let me just mention something that's of interest here. Occasionally we find a student who's had it. Say that you have a tumor on your thoracic cord. And the orthopedic surgeon has to get into it. It's all surrounded by bone. What's he going to do or she? You're going to do what's called a laminectomy. You cut through the lamina. We'll make this in green so you can see it. We're defining a laminectomy now. It allows us to get to the cord. You cut through the lamina. cord. So you can see when you do that, you can just lift off the spine and you'll have the cord exposed. So I've done a laminectomy in green. Does anybody know which area of the cord is more prone to tumor formation? Has anybody had a tumor on the cord? No, I had a student once. She had it, and they kept taking it off, kept taking it off, kept coming back. She didn't live too long. It was very unfortunate. But she understood a laminectomy. But the thoracic area is most common most common site for tumor formation.
So it's important to know them. Know your spinal cord. Now, what are alterations of the vertebra that will differ from this basic, typical vertebra? Well, let's start with C1, first cervical. It's already different. These are, let's just take C1. Does anybody know what it's called? The atlas, sure. This is the atlas holding up the skull. We've said that before. So it's going to be articulating with what skull bone? What's the part of the skull just immediately superior to the atlas? Occipital, right? Sure. Here's the back of the skull. It's easy. Here's occipital. Here's the atlas vertebra. So it articulates with occipital bone. And with C2. But it's characteristic. You might see it all by itself, and you say, but that's no vertebra. Whoops. Can you see it? <laughs> Those in front can, I'm sorry. It's just a ring. There's no body. First cervical vertebra has no body. You saw how big it was on our typical. So it's a ring. It'll have a little spine, a little transverse process, something like this. This is the vertebral canal. Looks very different. How about C2? C2 looks different because it has this tooth-like process. This is C2, and it's got a tooth-like process sticking up there. What does that represent? That's the body of the first fused to the body of the second. So C2 differs because the body of C1 fuses to body of C2. I remember a PhD exam not too long ago, bioengineers. The engineers hadn't had their anatomy, the bioengineers had. So they knew the function of this process. It looks like a tooth, so it's called the odontoid process. Odontoid process. It's what is formed when C1 body forms to C2 body. But it's very important because you have this little projection coming here. The best way for you to do it is to use your hands. And you can make a C1 vertebra like this and use your thumb. This would be C2. And that, turn it this way, goes into here. And so it allows you to do this. You're rotating around that odontoid process. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> So those are two unusual characteristics for a vertebra. Then the um, thoracic vertebra have to have facets for ribs. The other vertebras don't have them. Let's see, we want thoracic. They have facets for ribs. They also have very large spines. You can see they're, they're longer spines, but they're lying sort of flat. So longer spines than the adjacent vertebra. And then the lumbar, since they're weight-bearing, they have the largest bodies. Very different. I mean, you 
on a test. All you have to do is give you a, a C, whoops, a C1 versus the lumbar. See that huge body? I don't know, can he pick it up? Maybe not. See if I can do it. Yeah, I'll see that huge body? All of that is body. Whereas that is one. Now you can see the odontoid process. So you can see how that goes up. All right, those are just some important characteristics which will allow you to uh, identify which vertebra you're dealing with. So the lumbar has a large body. And then we had the fused sacrum and the fused coccyx, right? So what have we got between the vertebra to cushion them? Here are the bodies from the front view. And you can see the cushions between them. What do we call those cushions? Intervertebral discs intervertebral discs. So between the bodies of the vertebra, between bodies of the vertebra equal the intervertebral discs. What are they made of? They're made of rings of cartilage, rings of, we're going to learn different types of cartilage because we have different kinds for different purposes. These have to be very strong, so rings of fibro, fibro cartilage. So what are we going to call them? Here's my ring. If I were to take it out from between, take this out, hold it up, this would be my ring of fibrocartilage. So it's called an annulus ring, annulus fibrosis, fibrosis. And it has a soft, gelatinous center, a soft, gelatinous center, a nucleus pulposus, nucleus pulposus. That was our core. So now, what is a slip disc? Well, it sounded like a slip disc would just be that that fibrous cartilage just slips out from between the vertebra. But in reality, a slip disc is the following. Since it's called an intervertebral disc, this is called a slip disc. And I have my outer annulus fibrosis intact, except for one area. So what is slipping out is the nucleus pulposus. So it will come out. And this is referred to as a slipped disc. Anybody had one? 
pretty painful, isn't it? Yes, it's supposed to be exceedingly painful. There are certain conditions which are exceedingly painful. But you can see why it is, because here's my disc. Here are the nerve roots coming out. So you get that slippage pressing on nerve roots. We have too much chalk today. <laughs> Keep dropping it. Um, pressing on a slip disc. Exceedingly painful. We'll find there are certain parts of the body that I can tell you that are also exceedingly painful as we go along. But fortunately, only one in the whole class has had one. How is it now? It's better. Was bed rest still? Yes. They say that's the best thing for it, is bed rest. With all modern technology, <laughs> sounds pretty good. All right. So now let's go on to our thoracic cavity. What are the constituents of our thoracic cavity? Oh my gosh, class has gone by already. Did you know that? <laughs> you feel it? You've been sitting there? All right, we'll, we'll just go through this quickly. Uh, what are the constituents of our thoracic cavity? Well, the sternum, the costal cartilages, The ribs, and what's posterior? Sternum, the browner your costal cartilages. Ribs, ribs, ribs. What's posterior? Just told you. <laughs> what do the ribs articulate with? What part of the vertebral column? Thoracic, right. So the bodies of thoracic vertebra. All right. I'm almost tempted to just keep going and then show slides next time so I get further. You want slides? Yeah, OK. All right, we'll do slides. But I'm slow today. Did it seem slow to you? I thought I was moving right along. Where'd the hour go? I've got to go through the whole rest of the appendage. Strange. Let's, let's move along and at least get our skull here. We talked about the upper jaw, the maxilla, the zygomatic process coming out of the maxilla here. Inside here on the medial wall, we'll have the lacrimal bone. Here's the nasal bone forming the bridge of the nose. And then we would have the zygomatic bone so that the whole arch is formed by the zygomatic process of the maxilla, the zygomatic bone, and the zygomatic process of the temporal bone. And we can see very clearly here, this is the vomer forming the septum. You'll see you have lots of projections inside to increase the surface area to prepare your air for breathing. So the lowest one, the inferior conch, is here, coming in from the lateral wall. Looks like a shell. That's why it was called a conch. But you have a medial, medial. You'll have a superior when we get along further. In the next one. And now, as we can see, the um, cheekbone clearly here, the maxillary part of the zygomatic, the zygomatic, the temporal part. Here's what this, what is this called back here? Pardon? Mastoid process. Remember that? But we want the hard palate. The anterior part of the hard palate is the maxilla. The posterior part is your palatine bone. 
What would happen if I drilled right through here? What would I encounter if I go between 46 and 43 into the floor of the skull? That's right. Good for you. That's how they reach it. Come up through the pharynx and come in through the floor, drill, and there's the pituitary. Good for you. I'm pleased for you. Next one. <coughs> And here you can see your mandible, the condyloid process, which will be your TM joint here. This is all temporal. This is squamous temporal. This is zygomatic temporal. This is mastoid temporal. And this is the TM joint with the condyloid process. Here's the coronoid process. It's going to have a big muscle that's going to fit in here and come down. And when it contracts, it'll close your jaw. This is the ramus. This is the angle. And this is the body. Next one. Here it shows it separate. I don't think we get anything different from this. See all the teeth in the mandible, teeth in the maxilla. Next one. Here are our vertebra as we see it as a column with our flexible vertebra down to the sacrum, five few sacral, and four coccygeal. We see the curves, cervical, thoracic, lumbar, and back to the sacral intervertebral discs between the bodies of the vertebra. And you get that nucleus pulposus exuding out, and it will impinge on the nerves that are coming in to the spinal cord. But you learn whether it's at C5 or if it's at T, T12 or T4 up here or C3. So you learn your vertebral column when you're in professional schools. In the next one, and this just shows progressive muscular dystrophy affecting the shoulder and pelvic girdles. Shoulder girdle was the one with pectoral up here. We were just getting to it. But you see the, what, is, what do we call this curvature? Pardon? Lordosis, right. But this is, we didn't get to the scapula, but it's just showing the wasting of the upper arm in muscular dystrophy. So you can see the scapula showing here. Why you get to know these so that you can treat people when they are defective. In the next one, and we didn't get to the scapula, but this is the spine, the chromium, the coracoid process. We're going to have structures, muscles attached to the whole scapula, but we'll continue with that next time. <coughs>